You're listening to Boobies and Newbies, brought to you by the Frolic Podcast Network. This episode is brought to you by two of Kensington's newest titles, Romancing the Rancher by Kate Pierce and The Spanish Daughter by Lorena Hughes. Fans of the podcast have heard me sing praises for Kate Pierce's contemporary Western romances many a times, and I'm definitely not the only one. In fact, one of Kate's previous books, The Last Good Cowboy, was an Amazon Best Romances of the Month selection back in 2017. Her latest release, Romancing the Rancher, is the sixth book in her Millers of Morgan Valley series, a spinoff of her super successful Morgan Ranch series. Now, as a native Californian, I absolutely adore the fact that this series takes place in California's ranch country. On top of that, I really enjoyed the behind the scenes look at the PBR rodeo. And mind you, this is coming from someone who knows next to nothing about the rodeo. So if you're a fan of authors such as Diana Palmer or Jennifer Ryan, and you love romance books emphasizing family bonds, community roots, and of course, sexy cowboys, then you will love Kate's books. And then there's The Spanish Daughter by Lorena Hughes, which is so unlike anything I've ever read before. I often receive requests from readers for historical romance recommendations that take place outside of Regency or Victorian England. Well, look no further. Lorena Hughes' The Spanish Daughter tells the tale of a young woman disguised as a man in 1920s Ecuador, weaving a thread of suspense with the history of her native country and inspiration sparked by a remarkable woman lost to the patriarchal history books, Lorena Hughes tells a story as necessary as it is captivating. It's a story about identity, family secrets, heritage, resilience, and of course, the irresistible allure of chocolate. Honestly, I'd read it for the chocolate alone. This Own Voices historical novel is not to be missed. You can find both Romancing the Rancher by Kate Pierce and The Spanish Daughter by Lorena Hughes wherever books are sold. Find out more at kensingtonbooks.com. And now, back to the show. podcast that asks novice romance readers to think outside the dick in a box and brave the unbridled world of erotica. I'm your host, Kelly Reynolds, and today we are getting hot, heavy, and HGTV with a brand new contemporary release from debut author Julie Hamilton. Today's book pick is what I would like to call serendipitous because just as the couple in this book's romance begins with a tweet... I first heard about this book via a tweet, so if that's not meant to be, I don't know what is. As always, you can catch up on past episodes of Boobies and Newbies on your favorite podcatcher or on boobiesandnewbies.com. Reviews on Apple Podcasts are always appreciated. And if you want to show the podcast a little extra love, please consider joining us over on patreon.com. Now joining me today is content coordinator for Verve Romance, Beth Cranford. I recently began publishing articles with Verve, an online community and forum dedicated towards discovering your own happily ever after through romance books, articles, and products. And I was all too excited when Beth agreed to join me on the podcast and talk about all things romance. Beth, welcome to Boobies and Newbies. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited. Oh my gosh, I'm very excited to have you, um, especially having now discovered Verve. Do you want to tell everybody a little bit about it? Uh, Yes. I started working for Verve Romance four years ago when we launched as Book in Main. So the name Verve may not be as familiar to some people yet because we've only recently had the name change. But we are exactly what you said. We're a romance community uh, designed to bring romance into your real life. Mm. So we want to talk to you about why you love books, what books you love, what your favorite tropes are. But we also want to talk to you about real life topics like relationships. We have 
advice columns. We have articles like you've written for us <laughs> about favourite books and worldwide traditions and just a community of inclusiveness for people who love romance as much as we do. Yeah, I think we need that. I think everybody needs community like that, especially when it's promoting something so positive and we could use all the positivity we can get these days. <laughs> Absolutely. And romance is such a positive thing. It's also an escape for so many people mm-hmm. in, in the world that we're currently living in. An escape is vital, I think, to keeping your sanity. So <laughs> romance readers are such wonderful people too. They're so friendly. They're often very open-minded and it's just nice to be around other people who you can say, I couldn't sleep last night because I kept reading until 3 a.m. <laughs> and have them say, oh, my God, I know I've been there. What book was it? I need to know more. Exactly. A romance reader will never criticize you for how late you stay up to finish a book. Never. No, I feel like we we would be more likely to criticize you. Like, you used a bookmark. <laughs> you, 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 you stopped. You didn't you keep reading. You were two to go and you stopped. <laughs> So now I have to know, what's the last book that kept you reading up until like 3 a.m.? I read um, A Most Unusual Duke by Susanna Allen. Um, I actually read it with Julie, who I work with at Verve, as a buddy read. And it kept me up until 1 a.m. And I did finish at... um, at two chapters to go at 1am only because I get up at 5.30 in the morning (laughs) and I'd gotten to the end of like the major part of the conflict and Mm -hmm. that I knew the rest was wrapping up that and I had to be responsible. It was difficult. It was so (laughs) difficult because the plot, and you'll see this when our review comes out, Mm. the plot was incredible. It was so different and so fun and I haven't read anything like it so I just kept turning the pages turning the pages yeah I need to know what all this means that's always the sentence that if somebody uses to describe a romance novel of like it's like nothing you've ever read or I've never read anything like it. That's always something that catches my eye because yes. we know we we love the genre, but we know that it's also built off of a lot of tropes that we see across books and a lot of the same conventions. And in a way, I think a lot of people love romance because of the predictability, like because we know going in that things are going to work out. It's going to be OK, like no matter what the obstacles are there is going to be the happily ever after, or at least a happily for now. This is the verbal contract that we are signing with the author and the publisher to like read this book. But when I'm, when I hear it's like nothing I've never read, then you've caught my, you've caught my ear. (laughs) I think there are moments when a comfortable read, something that you know is predictable and I hate to say it, but fluffy Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, is exactly what you need. I know I've been in those situations where I've been like, I don't feel well. I have a headache. I've had a bad day. I just want something that I know is not going to challenge me, but I'm going to enjoy because it's going to be fun. But you're right. There is something so exciting about finding something different and something that is – that you're not sure where it's going. Mm -hmm. And this book, A Most Unusual Duke, was um, I had no idea where it was going. And I will admit part of that is because I feel like the book was a lot smarter than I will ever be. But just the concept um, of a duke in Regency England also being a bear shifter and the cousin of... I didn't see that coming. (laughs) No, and his cousin, who is um, the Prince Regent, George, is also a bear shifter and it's this big secret among the time. And (laughs) I've never read that. I have spent probably the last three years of my life devouring every historical book I can get my hands on and I've never once come across a duke who is also a bear shifter 
No, and I can honestly say I don't think I've ever read a historical shifter book. Like that's, that's not to say it's not out there, but I know it's never come across my Twitter feed or Goodreads recommendations. No, and it came to my attention two ways. And it was so funny. It's one of those coincidental things. My friend Laurie sent me a review that was written on a blog Mm -hmm. um, or on a website. And then the next day I received an email from the publisher to say, have you heard about this book? It was Would you like to to read this book? And I was like, well, if I'm hearing about it two days in a row, Mm -hmm. then yes, I would like to read this book. Added bonus for the puns that the publisher put (laughs) it into the email because I live for puns, good or bad. Give oh them yeah, to me. no. I mean, I, there's an, most. I feel like most puns walk a fine line of like good and bad. So oh, it's absolutely perfectly fine. That's actually. It's funny you say that because it's similar to how the book we're talking about today kind of like came across my desk, so to speak. Is that I first saw somebody tweet about it, and then it was maybe like a day or two later where the author reached out to me and was like, "Hey, I just wanted to let you know, like I have." I'm a fan of the podcast. I have a debut romance coming out. And I was like, oh, my God, this is so funny that you're reaching out to tell me about this because I literally already like saved the title of this book to like a spreadsheet I had that I was interested in reading. So it also kind of felt like, oh, perfect. I'm getting this source from multiple voices. This seems like something that I should read. So I love when that happens. Me too. It's a sign. As I would say, yes. my mum and I like to quote, I think it's Sleepless in Seattle. She goes, it's a sign. And the mum says, you don't believe in signs. Yes. Oh, my God. I was going to say, if it's not Sleepless in Seattle, it's Serendipity. Because I feel like yes. those two movies really play off of that. Which I, it's not even my usual thing. I'm not somebody that's like super invested in the concept of fate. But damn, do I love both of those movies. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I cannot even begin to tell you how many times I have watched Sleepless in particular. Yeah. And just being able to quote it in day-to-day life is so such good. a joy. <laughs> that's put it on your resume. Like that's that's yes. a skill. <laughs> <laughs> it goes under those added skills at the bottom section yes. of the resume. <laughs> Able to quote almost the entirety of Sleepless in Seattle. <laughs> Hire me. Yeah. If I'm looking for a job, I will make sure to add it. What a great movie. Oh, God, we could just talk about that movie this entire time. But that's a whole other podcast. <laughs> it is. Maybe another time. Although I feel like this book could have been made into a movie. I would yes. watch this book as a movie. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, what a great segue into talking about our book for today. So <laughs> kudos to you, Beth. And I'll tell everybody that today's book is Just for Show by Julie Hamilton. And this is a contemporary fake dating romance. It was published in December 2021. It's available on Amazon for $4.99, Kindle edition. Although I do want to give a super special thanks to the author and Karina Press for sending me an advanced copy. I really appreciate it. And I completely agree with you. I think this what this has like all the makings of kind of a... It does have sort of a sleepless in Seattle kind of vibe to it now that I think about it. Uh, But like with a more modern lens. I mean, I have a lot to say about this one, especially because it takes place in Chicago and I lived in Chicago for a few years. So um, it, it in a lot of ways felt like a love letter to Chicago for me because you really do get to enjoy the city itself. They go to so many different places that I'm sure... If you don't know anything about Chicago, it won't matter to you. But I will say, as somebody who lived there, I did really appreciate the amount of detail that was put into the locations. I think it's clever to do that, to make your setting almost like its own character. Yeah. So I'm not overly familiar with Chicago. I've been there only once, and it was only for a couple of days. But I've read... A couple of books about Chicago Mm -hmm. and it just it made me long to go back and explore it in more detail to see more of the city that's so famous but is just not you know in my wheelhouse so to speak so right it was really clever and it 
like you said, it adds that sort of layer to the book that it might otherwise be lacking if it didn't have such a strong setting. Well, and you and I have talked about this because I'll be writing a little bit about this for Verve, but I'm hosting a reading challenge this year called 50 Romances, 50 States. And I, of course, read this and was like, oh, great. I'm adding it to my my Illinois recommendation list. But what I love about this is that it doesn't just like take place. It's not like it's just in Chicago, like Chicago is like the backdrop. You know, it's it's you're right. It really is like a character where you get to they take multiple train lines. They go to different neighborhoods and they eat at all these different breweries and restaurants. And I just it was it would be one of those books where I'm like, if I lived in Chicago, I could like take myself on a little literary date to like go see these different areas and like follow the map that our characters follow in this book. So I, yeah, it it called out to my heart. I wish there were a lot more books that, that did this. Like I know that we know that there's so many that take place in New York and LA and I feel like a ton in Seattle, especially hockey romance. A lot (laughs) in Seattle. I was going to say, I feel like Seattle is very popular yeah, I've read a lot set in Boston or yeah, and Denver. I feel like Denver's like a well, and even like um, what maybe not so much. I was gonna say Texas, but I feel like most of the time it's not as much in the city in Texas as it is in like small town, you know, rancher kind of yeah. life. But but I mean, I live in Portland, Oregon now, which is um, you know, on the smaller side of cities, I guess, but. Yeah, I don't know. I would love to see, and this is something I I know I talked about during our 12 Days of Boopsmas episodes, is just that there's so many small town romances, which I love, especially during the holidays, but where are like the move into a big city kind of romances or grew up in a big city and never left kind of, because that's the story we get here. And I love that. I know it's like not a major part of the story, but I really love that. Yeah, I think it is a different side. It's small town romance is so popular and yeah. I think it will always be popular and for good reason. There's something so cozy about it and familiar and friendly. But you're right. I, you know, I'm thinking back on all the books that I've read and the only one that I can kind of think of is a Jennifer Ryan book. Mm. which is set in Montana and the female, the heroine has come from New York city Mm. to hide away because she's in danger. You know, And (laughs) so she's got that sort of city girl fish out of water thing, but it's also not the same as exploring. It's still small town. You know, it's (laughs) not the same as walking into an airport in New York City. I'm trying to think of the names. Kennedy, I think. And just being overwhelmed with the Mm -hmm. people. I know the first time I came to America and I was in LAX and I could not fathom how many people were around me. Yeah. It was an overwhelming number of people and it never let off. That's the thing about cities is that there is always people. Always. And so... Yeah, it's just not a side of romance that I feel like I see very often. Yeah, especially during holiday romance. I dare you to like find a holiday romance that takes place in the city. And if it is in the city, nine times out of ten, it's New York. Um, Yes. Yeah. We need to do like a reverse Hallmark. Yes, exactly. Where the the small town girl (laughs) is the fish out of water in the big city. She buys a publishing house, perhaps. <laughs> there you go. Look, the story writes itself. I, we've got our work cut out for us. <laughs> Call us, Homer. We're available. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, let me give everyone the brief-ish synopsis for Just for Show, and then we will dive into our discussion and review. So we will start here with hashtag Twitter Bay Forever. They'll fake a relationship for social media exposure, but can they be more than a hashtag? Here's how things are going so far for me in Chicago. One, messed up my attempt at asking out the gorgeous woman next to me on a plane. Oh, okay. So this is the actual tweet that Luke does send in the beginning of the book. 
two, couldn't catch up to her at O'Hare. That's the name of the airport in Chicago for anybody that's not, you know, in the know. Three, I'm hoping she finds me on Twitter. Four, maybe if she sees this, we can split another cheese plate sometime. It doesn't take long for Luke Murphy's tweet to go viral. So it also doesn't take long to reconnect with Audrey. Nailed it. But at what cost? His network has put his whole career as a TV home renovations carpenter on the line. A mid-air meet cute is exactly what they want. After recovering from the shock, Audrey Whitaker can see the benefits of faking a relationship for social media exposure. She'll get the publicity to launch her photography business, her lifelong dream, and she'll get to spend time with a man who can, as his fans say, really fill out a plaid shirt. <laughs> Luke and Audrey agree to spend the summer together to get what they each need, then say goodbye. And to keep it professional, they'll follow all the rules, except the no kissing one, and maybe the no sex one too. But with so many on the line, they definitely can't fall in love. Ooh, <laughs> spoiler alert, they do. Oh, man. Yeah, I, I have to say, I think when I saw that original tweet that was kind of just pitching this book, it was... There was something about home renovations, which I was like, great. I love HGTV. I love a good home renovation show. Love it. And then there was something about there being a no sex pact. And I was like, oh, that is one of those tropes that I didn't realize I loved because I never really like put it into words. But then when I see somebody else say no sex pact, I'm like, oh, my God, you're right. That's exactly that's what I love. And it makes sense because I love fake dating. So I think that's kind of one of the things that goes hand in hand with fake dating. So no sex pact, home renovations. Those are the only key words I, I need to hear to read your book, basically. I mean, fake dating is a very big draw yes. for me. I love a fake dating book. Um, anything where they're, they've got that push-pull where it's they have to be together. It's kind of mm -hmm. like forced proximity. You know, you have to be together because you're dating, quote unquote, but you were also hands off. So, yeah, yeah I don't think I realised I was into the no sex pack thing <laughs> until this minute. I'm having a revelation. Yeah, like, oh, you only get one bed, but you can't use it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, gosh, it's true. I love being I love the chase. I love being teased. I love like drawing things out. And boy, do they draw it out because I, I want to say they don't have their first um, initial hookup moment until beyond the 50 percent mark in this book. So, yeah, if you like a good slow burn and, and will they won't they? I think you'll really like the the romantic sexual tension between the characters in this book. Definitely. I can be an impatient reader. <laughs> I can um, too. <laughs> so I don't know if you're familiar with the TikTok trend, you know, the can we skip to the good part? Yes. <laughs> but that's me sometimes when I'm reading. But by the same token, I also really thrive on the tension that exists yeah. there, especially when it's not forced in a way that feels fake. Mm -hmm. So, which is funny because it's fake dating. Fake dating. <laughs> but yeah, it's it was a slow burn. Yes. And I did sometimes want to skip ahead a few chapters or, you know, shake my Kindle and be like, just, just already, please. <laughs> <laughs> but then you you do get to that moment and the payoff is great wonderful yeah. their first kiss was chef's kiss yeah delayed gratification at its mm -hmm. finest yeah I have to say too I there's a lot that I really do like about this book I I liked um first of all just the concept in general because I feel like we've all kind of had this fantasy about falling in love with somebody that you end up sitting next to on the plane or like you meet at the airport. Like that is, I think that would definitely be in like my top five, like fantasies is like finding that person like on a plane. And so 
to start with, you know, Audrey kind of upgrading herself to first class because she earned it after a shitty work trip and meeting this guy and they share a cheese plate. Are you kidding me? This is the stuff of my dreams. And <laughs> and then, you know, kind of it, it goes exactly the way I know it would go in my real life, which is she freaks out and like runs off. I'm like, yep, that's that's accurate. Relatable. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely relatable. I, I, when I was making notes so that I could remember <laughs> the parts that I loved most, because like you, there are a lot of things I really loved about this book. Her relatability factor was so high. Through the, the roof. When she says she wasn't sure she wanted to share her cheese, I was like, girl, <laughs> same. <laughs> then she gets so awkward getting off the plane. I've yep. been on enough planes in my life to understand yep. that feeling of you have to get off yeah there is a wave of mm-mm. people that will trample you like it's black friday those people behind you, you that move. are like standing up like before it's even close to their turn to get right. off you're like it's, that pressure <laughs> is so real and she she handled it exactly the way i would have and then yep. the third most relatable moment was when she said her friends were coming over and she's like i don't put on pants for real pants for very many people (laughs) and definitely not for them. Okay. So this woman is me. So yes, no, I, you and I should be meeting people on airplanes right now. Exactly. It's so true. No, I, Audrey, Audrey is one of those characters that I think at first glance for a lot of people, if they don't want to think about it and really digest it, I think she can come across as unlikable. And and I think it's just because she's the reason I started I, I would have to like think about it be like why am I like not into her? It's because it's me. Like there were just so many things, so many flaws that she had that I was like this is exactly, you know, would I act any differently in this situation? I don't know if I would. So I know that there was a lot of internal judgment um, as I was reading this book where, again, this is why I always tell people if you find yourself judging characters, if you find yourself disliking them for whatever reason, stop and think about what that reason might be because chances are good it's not the characters, it's you and (laughs) that's okay. But I just, I want people to recognize like, what is it that I don't like about not even characters. Maybe it's a specific trope you don't like. Maybe it's a specific, um, you know, setting. What, whatever it might be, just kind of try to digest that a little bit more. And this was one of those books where I did have to do that a few times because I found myself constantly getting frustrated, mostly with Audrey. Yes, I did too. And that's why I loved those relatable moments because it reminded me Yes, that she was... I want to say she's a real person, but clearly yeah, she's exactly. a fictional <laughs> real person. She was very well written to have those dimensions. And I think we don't credit characters with having dimensions as much as we should, Yeah, especially heroines. Yeah, and so exactly. the fact that you and I both had to take a moment to be like, oh, you're driving me up the wall, but mm-hmm. could also be like, oh, you love cheese and you don't want to share cheese. You're my new best friend. Um, yeah. Really says something for who she is as a character. And I think there's a massive discussion that could be had about the way we judge particularly female characters. And I know oh, I'm yeah. guilty of it. And I know I did it in this book. So I loved finding I too. being brought back to those moments where I was like, she's she is me, just probably better hair, um, <laughs> taller, thinner probably something along those lines and he does say she's she's curvy curvy? I was like I I always have a hard time like um actually picturing characters like and that's just I don't I don't think I really I don't care as much about like their their visual representation but whenever I hear curvy I'm like oh okay now I'm intrigued (laughs) sometimes I have to admit when I hear curvy I think of Jessica Rabbit that like accentuated oh, curve. Real curvy. <laughs> yeah. So, and I'm not sure that says about me as a human being. We probably <laughs> probably need to save that conversation for my therapist. But 
yeah, I but it is nice right. when they're not rail thin, when yeah. they're not talking about like her flat belly. Because yeah. even when I was younger, pre kids playing sport every day, I never had a flat belly. Oh no, um, mm. it's just not in my makeup. So it is nice. Not me either. Sadly, for I feel like just <laughs> for one day, I would like to experience it because there's a part of me that thinks once I've had a flat belly, I could be like, okay, well, I don't need to do that anymore. That was great for a day. Now yep. I'm done. I yeah, just it's, wanted it's... to try it, see what it was like. <laughs> see how my clothes fit differently. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, it's, it's funny because I feel like curvy means so many different things to so many different people. And like, if you identify as like, a fat woman like I do or a plus size woman, you know, whatever terminology you prefer. I feel like curvy is usually kind of like the safe choice um, in terms of like language that we use in romance novels, at least today, because I don't think curvy today necessarily means curvy 10 years ago. Like no. I, to me, curvy is always kind of like I have a weird relationship with it just because I, I feel like it's sort of a cop out to defining somebody's like actual body shape but it's not it's not something that I that I really point out or like you know bothers me when I'm reading it's just something that I'm like oh okay she's curvy what does that mean like what (laughs) what exactly does that mean you know but um I know that that's I I think it's a safer word choice that a lot of authors use today and and I don't want to fault them for that because I know that not everybody's as comfortable saying they're fat and being okay with it as like I am. So um, it's it's <laughs> to each their own. <laughs> well, it's a, it's probably a good blanket term too. You know, you can picture yourself exactly. as curvy. You can say I'm mm-hmm. curvy and I as a size sort of 16 to 18 woman can say, yes, I am curvy. But I also feel like somebody who's maybe a, an eight or a ten or a twelve can also claim could to also be say curvy, that. yeah, because of their body shape. It's the mm-hmm. shape of your body that is different. So, and curvy looks a, different on, depending on how tall you are exactly. or like how you know. I mean, it's well, oh, how you God, carry stupid. the weight on your body too. Yeah, some exactly. people have very long legs, and some people have mm-hmm. very short legs, and. So it is a good blanket term. I think in that sense, it's sort of, I hesitate to say inclusive because that has, that word has so many greater meanings. But I understand but it does. what you're saying. Yeah. It does yeah. allow you to sort of picture yourself a bit more in that situation because I can't picture myself as a six foot tall, you know, Claudia Schiffer type. No, I no, no, like no, I'm no. aging myself with the <laughs> old supermodel reference. No, just classic. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> No, I'm with you. I'm a size 18. And so like size 18 looks different on a lot of different people, a lot of different bodies. So yeah, again, this this is not a criticism of, you know, the description or like Julie Hamilton's use of it in the book. It's just something that that I've thought about more in like the last yeah. couple of years, especially as a lot of people have like reclaimed words like fat and yes. You know, that I, I, I'm not, I don't know, I, I wouldn't shy away from like using words like that in books, but I know that that's also a major turnoff for a lot of people. So curvy, I think you're right. It's it's a nice blanket statement that can apply and appeal to a lot of different bodies. And so when you're reading the book, you can put yourself in the position of Audrey, a curvy woman, regardless of if you're a size eight or, you know, 28, like Mm -hmm. it's, it'll look different for everybody. But, you know, a lot of people do want to put themselves in the place of one of the characters. So that does make sense to me. Absolutely. Anyway, back to airplane (laughs) romance. But no, and then I think the other fantasy element of like, not only do you, you know, meet this stranger on a plane, but this stranger then ends up being the star of a TV show and they tweet about meeting you on the plane and then the tweet goes viral and all these people want to know everything about you. I think that would appeal to a lot of people, at least at first glance, because I think what we see in this book is sort of how I would expect it to go in real life is, oh, this is so great. We're getting this attention. We each have this project that we want to build attention upon for our careers but then it becomes 
oh my God, people are butting into our private lives and people are photographing us when we don't want to be photographed and taking away these special moments between us as things become real and we can't tell what's real and what's for show. So I, the idea of fame is like both exciting and then also like fear crippling. Um, Terrifying. Absolutely. Oh God. Which is why I like writing because I feel like a lot of people don't necessarily recognize writers on the street. (laughs) Correct. I watched a movie over Christmas with Brooke Shields in it. And I said in, when I was like thinking about it and talking to people about it, my first thought was she is the most famous writer in the world. Everybody (laughs) recognizes her. Oh, was it the one at the castle in Scotland? Yes. Oh, loved it. (laughs) It was such a cute movie and I'm always down for a Duke and a Scottish accent. Yeah. And, um, but my, my thought when she was being recognized by people was, how is she so famous as an author? Um, but I guess, you know, I if Nalini Singh, who's my absolute favourite mm-hmm. author, walked past me on the street, I would be like, oh, my goodness, that is <laughs> Nalini Singh. I would recognise her and then I would probably melt into a puddle. But this this book was so so well done with that, like you mm-hmm. said, that realism of the fame journey. You know, I've yeah. certainly had fantasies where Chris Evans has sat next to me on an aeroplane mm. and fallen in love with me. Mm. Um, but it would, you don't, you don't ever take the fantasy past that part where yeah. then you're getting recognized and you're getting judged and you're getting no. questioned. And this book was a really solid sort of commentary, I think, on that side of social media where people, it starts off so positive. And Mm -hmm. I also really loved the fact that romance novel Twitter got a (gasps) shout out there. It got a a shout out. They, yep, loved it. (laughs) Because romance Twitter could absolutely blow this up. That is so something that we would do. Um, But then the flip side of that is it gets out of control and people do, like you said, start intruding on your private moments and, it does create questions about is this one big performance or are these moments that feel real to me also real to this other person? You know, Luke was yeah. feeling it. He knew that it was becoming real for him, but he couldn't tell the difference in what Audrey was feeling and he probably should have asked. But how do you go about asking That's, something like that? And I- and I do think as frustrating it was, as it was, I do think that was very a very real scenario, especially I, I liked that she was a photographer because I feel like if she wasn't a photographer, I would have still wanted her to have some sort of, you, you don't want a character to like want to make a living at being like an influencer. Like that's, it's not, it's not necessarily like a, a very likable trait for lack of a better word is like you want somebody to be an influencer and so I think this was kind of a a good way to show that here's somebody who actually does want to make a living based off of capturing photos and like showcasing you know part of the world or how they see the world and everything so adding in that element to we have to take photos and pretend to be a couple on social media of course he would have doubts that like she she wouldn't be in the same place as him because it's also for her career. Like he's trying to promote a show he's making and there's similarities there, but he's not a star. He's not active on social media. He's not out there trying to like get people to notice him. He gets annoyed when people are making memes about his butt. Like, and so I, for her, it's something different where I could see why he would have all these questions and not want to voice them because for him a lot of the time he thinks that she's in it just for the job and just for the attention and in a way she is at least at the very beginning and and I can't fault her for that either she's trying to start a photography empire like that's what you got to (laughs) do yeah absolutely one of the great things is that there was an equality to the need for the fake relationship here but you're absolutely right. His need for it 
is very different to her need for it because for her it's her livelihood. You know, she had that girl boss moment, as we say, when she quit her job, but that also leaves her in a precarious position. And so you can see her trying to hold on to that control, which is one of the things that maybe makes you go, Audrey, come on now. (laughs) But, (laughs) you know, she she does need it. It is important Mm -hmm. to her. And she knows how to stage things too. I feel like it would be very easy for someone who doesn't understand social media. Like Luke Mm -hmm. clearly is not a social media person. Um, So he wouldn't necessarily be as familiar with the difference between setting up a shot and just happening to catch a moment, which Audrey is undoubtedly intimately familiar with as a photographer. So, yeah. Yeah. Frustrating, but understandable. Like I, yes. I will say that's the, that's if I could like sum up this book the in like a sentence. <laughs> yeah. It would be frustrating dot, 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 but very real because <laughs> there are just, and that's what I love to read. I talk about it all the time on the podcast that I love reading, especially in contemporary romance. It's hard for me to kind of let go of realism because it's set in the modern day world we live in. And so it's it's hard for me to kind of set upside things that don't feel real because how can you pick and choose what is real when we live in like today, we live in 20, if this book is set in 2022, aside from talking about COVID, which I personally don't want to read I about in my books. No, thank you. But aside from COVID, um, you know, I, I can't read a book at, that's set today and have people using flip phones. I can't read a book <laughs> today and have people talking about how it takes them five minutes to drive across Los Angeles. Like it just, there are certain things that I'm like, I get the element of fantasy, but you're not going to sell me on these fantastical things when it just doesn't fit with where it's taking place and the time it's taking place. And that's what I loved about this book was it felt so real. Like Mm -hmm. they made mistakes all the time when one of my favorite scenes is when they finally decide that they're going to have sex and they're driving back to her apartment and he cannot find parking. And I thought that was the funniest fucking part of the whole book. Yes. Oh my god. And they stop to buy condoms. Um oh no, they're they're trying to find parking and when they end up parking they're like, "Oh, well we're by a drugstore. Should we go in and get condoms?" I'm like, <laughs> "Yes, yes, get the condoms." Like I live for the awkward, real, messy moments and this book is full of them. <laughs> It really is. And I'm like you. I, with contemporary romance, I need it to go one of two ways. Mm -hmm. So ridiculously over the top. Yes. That there's no way that it's real. And the only. It's just all bananas. It is, you know, it's your billionaires that will growl at somebody for even looking at you wrong (laughs) and then shower you with gifts. And they're always beautiful and sculpted and so kind and generous, but somehow single. And sure. in abundance, there are thousands of billionaires, apparently, and not one of these fictional billionaires has a rocket, phallic-shaped rocket, um, just waiting for, to shoot them up into the sky. And Or, I'm like you, I want it to feel very much like it could happen. You know, this mm-hmm. could be my life. I could sit on a plane next to somebody from HDTV who I don't recognise. I don't watch HDTV. GTV so that could happen to me if it was a baker from like a baking show I would be like hello but that's another story (laughs) but yeah it is it's that realism that makes it so enjoyable and I'm so glad you mentioned the parking scene because I thought it was so funny the way they were like well it's only two blocks away like we only have to walk two blocks because That's that we need to do it right now moment in so many books results in something like them doing it in the car or against a wall in an alley or Or as soon as as soon as they're in the house, like they're in the car, then they're being pushed up against the door immediately after. 
but this really went into that awkwardness of your first time when you're trying to sort out what goes where <laughs> do we have condoms whose house are we going to go to oh am I going to get a is it worth it to get a double parking fine to get a little something something you know so and- no but you're so right like a lot of the times it it does the immediate like we we lock eyes or we have that kiss and then all of a sudden next chapter we're in the house doing mm-hmm. it and and so I loved <laughs> that we actually get to see the time of like, how did we get from point A to point B? Like, and, and it kept the tension up too. Yes. Like, they didn't lose that <laughs> need for each other. Mm-mm. And I didn't lose that need for them to finally, finally do it. And I guess that's the brilliance of a slow burn is you've been yeah. waiting for so long, but you're willing to go into the pharmacy to grab condoms. And to yep. make sure you have quarters for the parking <laughs> meter or whatever it is. <laughs> but it was, it, yeah, it's it's just, it's nice to see that and to feel like it's something that your friend could be telling about. Like you could yeah. be telling me this story as if it happened to you and I'd be like, believable. For real. No, for real. And that's that's what makes it feel so real. And I, I really liked, I'm wondering... I'm wondering if this is going to kind of spiral into a series of sorts. And I don't know. Um, The two questions that I have specifically for the author are, are there going to be more books in this series? Because we, we meet a lot of really fun characters. You know, we've got Audrey's two friends. um, We've got Luke's cousin. Yes. um, Who I'm like, Ooh, I want, I want him to get somebody. I want Aiden's book. I, I do too. Never quite got my hands around what Luke and Aiden's relationship was, which <laughs> for cousins I feel like is okay because mm-hmm. on the one hand you feel like they're mates, they're friends, they yeah. he respects Aiden's work as a contractor. He listens but sometimes doesn't want to listen to what he has to say. <laughs> Aiden's but kind of Aiden, a loud mouth. <laughs> yes, and he brought he brought levity to every scene that yes. he was in. And I would read a book about him. And I so would that's what I was curious about. I would love to see him hook up with one of her friends. Her friends, like, yes, mm-hmm. yes. Okay, I would love that. We are starting a two-person campaign now for Julie <laughs> Hamilton to give us either Aiden and <laughs> Natalie or Aiden and – I wrote it down. Grace. Grace. Yeah. Grace. Very yeah. good, yes. I could, I, I'd be here for it. And I know, I know that they won't get their own book, but I did also love, um, Luke's family. I loved his mom. I loved his sister. sister. I loved meeting his sister's girlfriend. I was like, oh, this is so sweet. This is like, so again, just the family interactions, like both with his family and with her family just felt so natural. They just felt like yeah, this makes sense. Like uh, her dad used to be a reporter. He asked a lot of questions and his mom is doing the whole mom thing of like wanting to know every little tidbit about who her children are dating. I'm like, that's great. I love it. So I really loved these characters. Um, I'm assuming Julia Hamilton either lives in or has spent a good amount of time in Chicago. And I would love to continue going on tours of Chicago with her and these people so and then my other question for her was whether or not this story was inspired by an actual um event on twitter like was this based on like an actual twitter post that somebody made and then they went and found the person and i'm sure there have been countless twitter posts like that in in the past um especially because i'm thinking back in the days of like craigslist missed connections post oh like those were so good i i used to read those just for fun like i mm. mean just to just to see oh my god this person missed talking to this person on the bus like those were so good i don't think they do them anymore but i will urge everyone if you don't know what i'm talking about to google craigslist missed connections because it was it was a vibe. It was a vibe. It was great. <laughs> Maybe it, it could either be based on a tweet like that or mm-hmm. she has met a really handsome man on an airplane once, sat next mm-hmm. to him, shared a cheese plate, and now yeah. she's just doing the what if thing. 
And I this kind of yeah. hope there's part of me that hopes that that's what it is. Like this is her playing out something that didn't happen. <laughs> so she gets satisfaction. Like she gets say completion. It makes it sound so dirty, <laughs> but <laughs> but the other part of me is like, no, that would be terrible if you met this beautiful person on an airplane <laughs> that you really connected with, and then you never saw them again. And then it turned out to be one of the property brothers. <laughs> I yeah, like that would be. I feel like anybody would recognize a property brother because yeah, I mean, I know you don't watch like HGTV and, and I, you know yes. who the property brothers are. <laughs> exactly, give me some obscure name, and I would be like, no idea who that is. Now, mm-hmm. if he is famous for his butt gifts, like Luke is, you might maybe know I would him. recognize him from behind. <laughs> because yeah, I've seen my romance fair share novel of gifts. Twitter. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of great shout outs for the romance community. We've got romance novel Twitter. We talk about arm porn. And mm-hmm. I'm just like, oh, great. Awesome. We're th- This appeals to a lot of people, but specifically romance readers. I'm here for it. So yeah. let's talk about, um, you know, we talked about it a little bit, but did you have a favorite steamy excerpt that oh. maybe you wanted to share or just discuss? I'm open. I mean, my favorite steamy I guess moment was actually their first kiss after the the kiss cam and that sort of where they went at it it's I'm a I'm a big fan of first kisses I feel Mm -hmm. like if done well a first kiss can actually be more pivotal to a story to believing in a relationship than the first sex scene now we already discussed that their first sex scene the build up to it was very realistic, but that first kiss moment, and I wish I had highlighted it. I didn't, (laughs) but that first kiss moment where it's just, it's like they couldn't control that attraction anymore. And it just flames off the page. Mm -hmm. And you think this is it, you know, this is the moment. This is finally, we're getting somewhere. That's the impatient part of me. That's like, yes, we're at the good part. Um, and it didn't necessarily go the way that I wanted it to, but it did mm-hmm. go in a way that felt very very realistic for the setup of the book. So that was probably my favorite sort of steamy-ish moment. It was steamy. It was a steamy yeah, kiss. And they're a... out in public. Like, I mean, it's – I'm not a and big there's... PDA fan in general, but it was a hot kiss. It was a hot kiss. And it had that ele- added element of that, what makes enemies to lovers romance so enjoyable when they're just at each other's throats and it's either (laughs) we're either going to fuck or we're going to fight. And it's that she applied that principle to the kiss, to that first Mm -hmm. kiss. And it was wonderful. But obviously that first sex scene was really great as well because of all the aforementioned reasons I've never, never read a book where parking was so intimately tied, <laughs> which my my dirty mind, my mum is going to listen to this. My I'm sorry, mum, but my dirty mind loves the sort of parallel of trying to fit into a car park, like parallel fitting it in there and then going at home and fitting Park it, in it in that car. <laughs> Yeah, no, when we were talking about parking a car, we were talking about a literal car. Just want to make that clear. <laughs> yeah, we probably should make that clear if people are like us out there. Park that car. Yeah, no, it, it was an actual car. But then they go have sex. But um, I I have a little um, short excerpt from the first sex scene. And it's it's when they're still, you know, just kind of like undressing and like doing a little bit of foreplay. And something else I really liked is... um they're really vocal in their sex scenes and not in so much a dirty talk kind of way or a I'm going to tell you what to do sort of way. He asks a lot of questions like, how do you want this? Does this work for you? Is this getting you off? And I was just like swooning because I love that. I, I love when couples are communicating, I especially love because I think we've set this expectation in society that like 
every man, every cishet man needs to know exactly what he's doing in the bedroom and be like an alpha, dirty talking, you know, kind of guy, give it to a rough and ready sort of thing. And and that is not Luke. No. And they have incredible sex. So um, just a, you know, just a note for any gentlemen listeners, or honestly, for anybody, like, it's okay to ask your partner what they want. It's okay to say, what can I do to get you off? What? How do you like to be kissed? Like, what is it? I personally find that so sexy. I was talking to, I can't even remember who now, but kind of like we were talking before about not realizing that no sex rules was a <laughs> thing that you want in your books. Yeah. Consent porn, basically, is what it I really want to call is. it. Where they're saying, are you okay? Is this okay? Do you want this? Can I do this? And it's that level of respect mm-hmm. that I think play, that was missing and mm-hmm. often played into the stereotype of romance novels where, you know, a man would just take a woman and she would enjoy it because she wanted it. Um, But now we're, we're at a point where characters like Luke can say, can I do this? Do you Mm -hmm. want this? And it makes it so much more intimate and sexy, like you said. So, yeah, I, yeah, that was one of the things I don't think I realized again until this particular moment that I was, <laughs> I always knew that I liked the consent aspect and I've loved mm-hmm. these last few years where you see it so much more in books. Yes. Where it's not like she's saying no, but he can tell she's saying yes by just looking at her. Mm-hmm. It's actual verbal. Vocal, I gonna, yeah. I was going to say physical because my brain was like... <laughs> Just put in, putting those Blowing words up. together. Yeah, exactly. Oh, <laughs> no, I, um, uh, I, I completely understand what you're saying. And especially the whole idea of like continue, continuously asking for consent. Like, is it okay if I touch you? Great. Now that we've established that, can I do this also? Mm-hmm. Like, I, I like when the, the, I like when the conversation continues throughout the sex, not just yeah. a, do you want to have sex? Yes. Because what does that mean? That means different things for different people. And you might be okay with one thing, but not something else. And you might like it a different way. And what, you know, when you're having oral sex versus penetrative sex. So, I mean, it's, I, I love it. So I do have like a little excerpt that is really just a lot of them talking like as they're doing it. And I love it. (laughs) Okay, here we go. I'm going to go from do, 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 do. He brushed his nose against her neck, kissed the spot where her neck met her shoulder. Her clit thrummed in time with her pulse. Touch me, she said. His right hand moved between her legs. He glanced up at her face, a silent check-in. She nodded for him to keep going. He teased along her folds. (laughs) Not my favorite word, let me tell you. I, whatever, we'll let it go. He teased along her folds, slick with her arousal. The rough pads of his fingers against her sensitive flesh made her gasp. He kissed her neck, the hollow of her throat, her chest, all the while continuing those gentle touches. When his thumb circled her clit, she grabbed his shoulders, her body jolting. Is that good? He murmured, kissing her collarbone. Yes. It was more than good. It was perfect. Do you want my fingers? Yes, please. She tilted his chin upward toward her face. Their mouths met in a fierce kiss. He touched and teased, still working her clit as he slid a finger inside her and then slowly another. I feel like there was another. I feel like I, I skipped a page, but. Say for one moment, you could read audiobooks. Oh my gosh. I enjoyed <laughs> listening to you read that. Um, and I also, you have such a great cadence for it and it just. And it's a great scene, too. I it mean, is a good scene. I think the scene's the a lot better than folds, my voice, but thank you. <laughs> with the exception of folds, which we're giving a pass to. Yes. It, um, yes. it really was a beautiful oh, moment. I really wanted to start the page before because he actually does ask her, like, how do you want me to touch you? How can I make you feel good? But that just gives you a, you know, indication a of. glimpse of. It's a. Yeah. 
really sweet sort of intimate moment, but it's also a lot dirtier than you would expect based on the cover. I, (laughs) when I looked at the book, I went to go buy it from Amazon and I saw the cover and I thought, oh, this looks like it'll be like a sweet, adorable romance. And it was. Mm-hmm. I was not expecting the sex scenes to go um, <laughs> as deep, pardon the pun, hey. as, <laughs> as they did. But I was here for it. I was absolutely here for it because it yeah. was part of who they were as characters. Some books, I feel like the sex isn't necessary because mm-hmm. the characters don't need that to build that intimacy but because of the aspect of fake dating and because they didn't know where the other stood the sex here was very much a part of what they needed to come together oh my gosh yeah. i'm on fire Hi, with the <laughs> no Ooh. it's cool my mom listens too so just hi moms all around but yeah. um no i'm i'm with you i do think you know, and, and this is a whole other conversation uh, and one I'm happy to argue about with anybody, but I feel I feel like there's been a lot of conversation lately just sort of around, you know, if you have to have sex in a romance novel, because I that's definitely been the assumption, you know, the, this podcast is called Boobies and Newbies. And I will say a lot of the newbie romance readers that I've had as guests on the show have always come on with the expectation that romance novels are going to be written porn that it is going to be sex 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 round the clock and maybe a little bit of story in between and that is not the case and you know granted there are plenty of romance novels and erotic romance novels and erotica that is very much centralized around a sexual journey and that is fine but people need to understand that reading a romance novel does not ensure that characters are going to have sex on the page in this book. They might have sex off the page. It might be closed door. They might not even kiss. And that is also okay, depending on the story you're reading. <laughs> I I love that you're saying this. This has been one of those, um, I don't know how to describe it, but it's one of my things is I love romance in all of its forms. I will read a romance book if it has no kissing, if it only goes as far as hand holding, or if it is a full blown sex fest. I love romance for all the reasons that it exists. And I get very frustrated when people refuse to acknowledge that one end of the spectrum or the other is perfectly acceptable. And it does happen that you'll see I've seen comments be like why would you bother writing a romance book if it doesn't have sex and I was personally offended by that Mm -hmm. because I think you would bother to write a romance book without sex because there's a beautiful love story to be told and there is a connection between two characters who are meant to end up together yes why would you write a romance book that was nothing but sex because sometimes relationships are built on a foundation of just pure lust where you Mm -hmm. can't keep your hands off each other and that's how it has to start for you and your significant other so yeah I think romance shouldn't be uh, pigeonholed as mummy porn or as just sex 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 but it also shouldn't be maligned if it doesn't have that I agree yeah every what you were saying just there I'm like throw my hands up in joy I love I love hearing (laughs) people who are on um on the same wavelength as I am when it comes to romance in that way and I think if you're listening to this and you do find yourself questioning that again I'm all about the questions I want you to question like Mm -hmm. question as much as you want I the best way for me to think about it for myself is just to remind myself because I personally I do like reading a steamier book that's not to say I haven't enjoyed plenty of books that you know are are not the steamiest I also like those books too but there are plenty of people in real life who have relationships and fall in love who do not have sex like sex Correct. does not equal love there mm-hmm. are plenty of people who live their lives on, you know, the aromantic or asexual spectrum. And that does not mean 
adding sex into relationships. And so for me to remind myself of that in real life, it why wouldn't I want to see that translated into my books? So yeah. that's just how I remind myself. However, it works for everybody else is fine. But, you know, I... The only rule we have in romance is a happily ever after. And I know people want to argue that too, but that's the one I'm not going to let slide. (laughs) I have, I agree with you on the happily ever after, but I also feel like happily ever afters in some cases can be so subjective. Oh, for sure. And so we had an article go up on Verve about ugly cry books and (laughs) um, it included a Nicholas Sparks book, mm. who, of course, is a hot <laughs> topic of discussion in the romance world, and somebody called us out on it. And my initial response was, yeah, Nicholas Sparks is not romance. But then the other part of me was like, who am I to tell somebody else who loved this book, who found it romantic, who um, found the love story in that book, that it's not okay that they love that and that they want to call it romance because for them that is romance so Mm -hmm. I can see that point of view it's not my point of view but then I also I said I think in the comment to someone technically I could call a love triangle book where the guy I'm or the girl that I'm rooting for doesn't get the doesn't get picked that doesn't have a happily ever after for me. Does that make it not a romance? If you pick the wrong point. person. Um, Interesting point. So it's, it's uh, and this is, this is why we do what we do at Verb is because there are so many things about romance that we could yeah. talk about. There is so much nuance in it that people will overlook because it's romance and yeah. because it's for literally centuries been cast aside as something dirty and that we don't talk about and that is Mm -hmm. beneath people but I could talk about it all day long and (laughs) I do talk about it all day long it's wonderful so yeah what a great I I mean you work for a place like Verve you that's your job you get to talk about it all day long and what a what a gift that is well We could talk about romance all day, but let's wrap up our chat about okay. Just for Show by giving this book um, a few ratings. And um, I say it all the time. I think ratings are just so subjective. But on this podcast, we grade specifically for heart, humor, and heat on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the very best that it could be for you, of course. So um, let's start with the heart. What do you think? I'm going to give this an eight for heart. I thought it had a lot of heart. I was slowed down a little through the middle because of the slow burn aspect. And like I said earlier, I am impatient, Mm -hmm. but I Mm -hmm. felt like it had so many heartfelt moments that should be recognized, you know, from the fact that he was so into her after such a short period of time that he wanted to get to know her better. And he did it by not objectifying her beautiful you know um and her female friendships there was so much heart in the way that she and her friends interacted that was beautiful for me so now I've said that maybe I'm going to go nine yeah that's and it's nine because I was I was planning to go with like closer to like a seven but then the more that I think about it I'm like I love his interactions he has with his family I love that they talk with her family We, um, you know, get to see her friend group and like their interactions. I also think there's something to be said about the heart that he puts into this like home renovation. Yes. And and, like the fact that at the end he actually buys the house that he was renovating and he's built a home for them and he proposes in the epilogue in this house. I was like, okay, I think I will bump it up to like eight, eight and a half because of that. That when he took her suggestion for that um, window area. The bench. Oh. I'm just like, Sold. sir, you have Sold. ruined 
looking at my husband who can build things, who literally built a small house in our backyard being like, what is wrong with you, sir? Where's my reading window nook? (laughs) You might have built me a staircase bookshelf that goes literally up our stairs, but I... Where am I supposed to sit? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I think the staircase is pretty good. <laughs> okay, fine. The staircase is wonderful. I do love it. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay, how about the humor? What do we think? Ha ha? <laughs> um, I feel like this is probably like a seven for humor. It's mm-hmm. got enough humor to make you laugh. The mm-hmm. parking, obviously. We've talked about that at length. <laughs> Those fun little awkward moments when they're just doing those things that make you want to yeah. almost laugh out of embarrassment. It was really good, but it wasn't over the top humor. It's not like your typical mm-hmm. rom-com where it's a laugh every single page. So put it somewhere in the middle, a six or a seven, enough humor to keep me reading. Absolutely. I'm with you. I, I'm six or seven, I think is spot on because it's, It's the kind of humor I personally like to read. It's not trying to be funny. It's situational humor where it's just, oh my gosh, what a funny, ridiculous, awkward situation these characters have found themselves in. I can't help but laugh because I'm embarrassed or like (laughs) I can relate, like whatever it is. And I like that. I like that. I don't need super laugh out loud rom-com screwball comedy I I also appreciate that I I grew up in theater there's no way I don't appreciate screwball (laughs) comedy (laughs) but it's I like this it's understated it's realistic yeah that's 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 it Mm. period um so um how about the heat level what do you think I know you said it was hotter than you expected it to be it was hotter than I was expecting it to be I'm also going to put it around a seven Okay. I felt like it had a couple of very specifically sexy moments. Mm-hmm. That kiss, I'm that kiss I'm telling you, I could talk about it for days. I loved it so much. The sex scene, the first sex scene, the part that you read with that consent porn was beautiful. Ooh, but yeah. it wasn't um it wasn't every single page. It wasn't one sex scene right after the other. It felt like a natural progression for the couple. Um, it was detailed when you were reading it, but it wasn't scene stealing, if that makes sense. You know, it just was a part of the book yeah. without being the central part of the book. And it wasn't super explicit. Like, I mean, no, it's... it was sexy, but it wasn't. Yeah. We're not talking about a reverse harem book, which, you know, <laughs> if I'm going to read something like that, I want it to be a 20 out of 10 yes, for something yeah. like this, which um, on a traditional like overall scaling, I would probably rate it like a four. I want it to be just this level of sexy where it's not so much that I'm mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm in need of a cigarette and a shower after. And <laughs> I promise I don't smoke, mum. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> I feel dirty. You know, I, I'm with you. I um. I'm torn because on like a personal, this always happens to me when it comes to like the heat level, because like, I feel like on a personal scale, I find it very hot. I'm like, this is the kind of sex I aspire to have. Like I, the competency, the um, (laughs) discussions, the, you know, consensual talk. I, Mm -hmm. I like that, um, you know, she tells them like, I don't think I can come again. He's like, roles so she can be on top and like Mm -hmm. what can I do to make it happen like to me it's like a nine or a ten because of that but then at the same time thinking about just like the other romance that's out there that we've rated as like a nine or a ten for this podcast I would probably keep it closer to between a seven and an eight um, because you do get a few scenes that are completely open door. You also get some steamy kisses. Are there toys or butt stuff? That's always like my marker for like <laughs> how high it goes. It's like you do need toys to and butt scale. stuff. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> exactly. I agree with that. So um, we didn't make it there. So I no. can't put it all the way. That, that probably comes after the wedding. You know, that's the bonus that I want. <laughs> the bonus epilogue. I love it. But um. Yeah, so I think I'd keep it at like a seven or eight, yeah. an eight. So we're we're definitely on the same page. Well, and then the final thing I want to ask that I feel like I haven't done as good of a job of asking on the podcast um, in the last couple of seasons, but I do want to 
just kind of return the focus to as far as the fact that I started the podcast specifically to kind of spread romance to newbie romance readers Mm -hmm. is do you think this would make a good romance read for a newbie romance reader? I do actually. I think this would be a really great jumping off point for somebody who's new to romance because it has all of the elements that make romance what it is. You know, it's lighthearted with a happily ever after. It has a hero who you want to fall in love with. It has a heroine that you can relate to that probably just like yourself drives you up the wall sometimes when you're like, (laughs) why do I do the things that I do? It's like, why did Audrey do the things that she did? And it has just enough humor like you said situational humor that's the perfect Mm. description you're in that moment you find something funny about it um and then it has those sex scenes which sex is still very very much integral to romance and like we said Mm. it doesn't need it but I think if you're new and you're expecting it this has a good level of sex and it's and it's good sex too. It's it like is you good said, sex. Consensual, steamy sex with an open door. So yeah, if unless somebody specifically said to me, I want to start reading romance, but I want it to have minimal sex, sort of mm-hmm. I'm talking closed door, fade to black, you know, I would not recommend it then. But otherwise, yeah, give it a go. It's it's a it's a really lovely book. Yeah, I agree. I think this would make a great, first of all, I would recommend it to newbie and longtime romance readers alike. I I think it's a great debut, like Mm -hmm. uh, as, as far as debuts go, I think she did an excellent job. Hamilton knocked it out of the park. (laughs) Yes, I agree on that completely. Yeah, but I I think you're right. I think it's sort of a, a safe entrance into romance because so much of it is, feels so realistic um you might read this book and then go and read another romance and be like well that wasn't like just for show like they weren't (laughs) as as cool and as you know natural and awkward as just for show but you know what not everybody also likes to read awkward realistic romance like I do um but what's wrong I think a lot of people I I know I know (laughs) we're judging you but it's it's true I think I think there are a lot of people, though, who like to see themselves reflected in their books in some way. And I think there are a lot of fantastic characters in this book. And again, fingers crossed for more with these characters, because you might find yourself in one of the side Mm -hmm. characters um, as opposed to Audrey or Luke. And that's okay. But thumbs up for this one. I'd recommend this one for sure. Definitely. It's a good barometer book, I think. A good one that you can go back to later and be like, this is a solidly sort of in the middle, in a great way kind of romance book that you can be like, I liked this, but then I read a book that was so ridiculously over the top and with screwball humor and I liked that even yeah. more. And you know that because you've read a book like this that is just sort of the epitome of what I feel yeah. like romance should be. And now it's uh, set a new bar for um, I'm looking for more car parking in um, yeah. in <laughs> yeah. my future if, reads. <laughs> if we don't get at least one car parking scene <laughs> every, say, five books or so on average. That's it. What's going I'm on? I'm giving up on the world. genre as a whole. <laughs> I'm going back to true crime and you can't stop me. <laughs> they park their cars in true crime. <laughs> <laughs> they do. Yeah, I mean, even they do. They park their cards on the side of the road to lure people towards. Them. Yeah, or there's a body in the trunk. I mean, <laughs> this. I'm glad we're on the same page because I literally <laughs> read romance and like watch crime, and those oh, are like. My I will be working, loves. you know, sitting on my couch, dogs beside me, laptop in my lap, and like Ted Bundy on my screen. Yeah, I just you know. finished watching one about Carla Homolka and. Part of me is like, how can I be two so different people? You know, on the one hand, love and sex and happily ever after and fantasies. And on the other hand, kills people mm-hmm. and has no remorse. It's the mix of the fantasy. And if you believe the fantasy too much, this is what happens. You're going to get thrown off a bridge. <laughs> That's where my mind lives 24-7 is you can fall in love, but he might also kill you if you go hiking. So 
<laughs> I um I love your mind. Your mind <laughs> is a place that I would like to visit. I think I would have a great time there. Yikes. Well, you are welcome anytime on the show, in my mind, whatever you want. Thank you so much for hanging out with me, Beth. This has been so much fun. Thank you. I had an absolute blast. I told you before that I was so nervous and it's just been incredibly enjoyable. I I loved every second of it. Yay. Awesome. Well, I'm excited to write more for Verve and see more coming out at Verve and just uh, everybody hop on over to Verve, both on social media and the website. Join the community. It's it's a fun place to hang out. I think it's wonderful. Otherwise, I wouldn't still be there after all these years. So, (laughs) And I encourage people to ask questions about it and give us suggestions of what they'd love to see. We love questions on this podcast. So the more questions, the better. Give me questions. Give me feedback. Tell me what you think I can do better. And I will be like, I'm on it. I will do this for you. Park park the the car. car. Thanks so much for listening. Boobies and Newbies is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more podcasts you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. You can follow Boobies and Newbies on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Boobies Podcast.